Hey, it's Greg Grunberg, uh, Snap Wexley from Heroes, and Commander Finnegan of Yorktown from a uh, little thing called Star Trek. And you are kneeling before the pod. Kneel Before Blog presents... Kneel Before Pod. And welcome to Neil Before Pod. It is Star Wars Day once again, and we are here to discuss the final entry in the Skywalker saga, as in the final entry that we've done, we've done the rest of them. But now we are up to Revenge of the Sith, the end of the much maligned prequel trilogy. I'm your host, Craig, and joining me to discuss this descent into darkness, this descent into scum and villainy, it's Angus. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm sure that you're aware that my powers have doubled since the last time we met, Craig. Doubled. There's measurable power levels. He's got a power bar that you can mm-hmm, see, mm-hmm. and it's double what it Clearly was when visible. I was yeah. I've put all my stats into, <laughs> into those powers. <laughs> That's good. That's good that you've done that. Hopefully you've stayed aligned to the light side. Spent yeah. all your points on the light side. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. There's, well, there's no point in sitting on the fence because then you end up getting nowhere getting nothing so you have to choose one or the other it's a binary a paragon or a renegade path exactly or if you want to do Knights of the Republic Jedi or Sith which is where that originally came from Uh, that's too on point too on point not vague enough anyway Revenge of the Sith we're here we've made our way through nine of the Skywalker saga movies three of which we did when they just came out rather than as a Star Wars Day thing so we've had six Star Wars Day celebrations since we started doing this now we have to get creative after this, which we'll discuss at the end. But what did you think of Revenge of the Sith after revisiting it on its 22-year anniversary, I guess? Pretty close. Wow. Has it really been 22 years? Yeah. Was it 2005 it came out? That seems about right. Yeah. It's long, isn't it? <laughs> it's a long one. It's got this sort of position amongst the prequels as some people say the good one. A lot of people <laughs> say none of them are good. I used to think of it as being the good one for a couple of reasons probably because you get more of that descent towards vader that anakin has been kind of trending towards although not all that well through the prequels not as much as i would probably have liked i was thinking about it and about how it was this sort of attempt to stick the landing we know what happens after the prequels we've seen the original trilogy we know where these characters have to end up their starting points for Star Wars slash A New Hope. And I feel like a whole lot of the prequels was kind of oscillating between George Lucas attempting one thing, throwing Jar Jar Binks against the wall to see if he would stick. (laughs) It didn't. And then kind of course correcting. And then constantly kind of course correcting and bowing to fan feedback or audience and critical feedback. And I feel like this one is another example of that where it's unbalanced it has the same problems with relying on cg backgrounds and 22 years later just looking horrific i think in some scenes i think probably at the time we were probably quite impressed with some of the scenery but now when you look at it and it, you've got real actors attempting to look at cgi characters and things and not really reacting to what's going on in front of them because fair play to them they wouldn't have known what it was going to look like and so yeah it's just a strange discombobulating watch <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've watched it in I don't know how long I don't revisit the prequels very often or at all, I probably never will again after this because of recording a podcast on it, I don't need to do it again unless I get invited on another Star Wars podcast in the future that makes me talk about Revenge of the Sith again or one of the prequels <laughs> but I have no intention of ever watching this again and I wouldn't say that this is the best of them, I know a lot of people do and I can understand why because it has more lightsaber stuff. It has more action in it than the other two. But I actually think Phantom Menace is the best of the three because I feel like it's the most honest. George Lucas went in there making exactly the film that he wanted to make. It wasn't very good, but how many directors can say they got to do that now? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that, like I was saying, it was always this course correction. Yeah, you're right. That one was the one he wanted to make. He wanted to do more comedy. He wanted to sell more action figures. But I think that I used to think of this one as being the best because you got that climactic battle. My 
impression was at least getting to see Obi-Wan and Anakin battle it out at the end was kind of what I'd wanted to see this whole time. I used to think as well that seeing Yoda with a lightsaber was cool, but I think watching this again, (laughs) I'm a bit like, "Mm, maybe not. (laughs) I've always liked the Emperor. I've liked Ian McDermott, his portrayal of him, and I think he gets to do his most hammy pantomime villain stuff in this as well so there are things to like and to celebrate and there are good performances in there despite the actors battling against some pretty terrible writing (laughs) yeah so it's not good and we'll talk a bit more about how my perception of the film has changed over the years or not even over the years because i haven't revisited it that often but my perception of the film has changed with my exposure to other areas of star wars actually which is interesting which is shouldn't because there's things in here that make a bit more sense to me because I know about other canon stuff that they play with and other Mm, things. mm -hmm. So we'll get to that. But shall we initiate spoiler 66? Yeah, I think I might have already (laughs) given away some spoilers during that, what was supposed to be spoiler-free. But yes, let's do it. The time has come. Execute order 66. Okay, we are now in spoiler territory, and this is probably the best point to do this, perhaps, but Angus, did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? You know, that rings a bell, and I think that, uh, like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon is supposed to sync up perfectly with The Wizard of Oz, I believe that the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise syncs up really well with this weird space opera I watched once. Well, let's find out. Let us cut to a dramatic reading that Kat has supplied of her telling us the tale of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Oh, very good. I'll just queue up my space opera video so that I can sync this. Hey guys, sorry I can't be there for today's podcast, but I bring to you my beautiful rendition of this movie's equivalent of the Shakespeare Star Wars books, which, as you know, are some of my favourite. A preface, before I begin is that this is not in fact a monologue by Palpatine in the Shakespeare Star Wars book because, of course, it is formatted as a play within a play. So you're about to hear me do some voices. A play within a play is when somebody within the play itself gets actors to perform. A very well-known scene of this is in Hamlet. So, yeah, it's interesting. (laughs) It's interesting. Let's just go for it. Attend, my boy. The players come anon. Enter three actors. The most lamentable and tragic tale of one Darth Plagueis, he the Sith of old. A story of ambition that did fail, of death that conquered over life, behold. Darth Plagueis I am called, and higher rise than any Sith throughout the galaxy. Indeed, my love, most mighty and most wise, so may you e'er remain and always be. Yet what shall come of me, if thee I lose? I tremble at the thought of your demise. Or what if fate did come, and me did choose? How shall one live, when that the other dies? It shall not be. I'll pick the lock of death. By force the midichlorians I control, and have obtained the power to grant a breath. In short, I can create life by my soul. My love, thy knowledge of the dark side frights. Should any human have such learning, dear? Methinks thou shalt not fear my dazzling heights when I do rescue thee from death severe. Now Anakin speaks. Pish, pray, what is this tale of wonder, sir? A story, lad, yet not as thou wouldst hear from Jedi mouths, for they would keep it hid. Tis but an ancient legend of the Sith. That's Palpatine, by the way, if you didn't guess. But could this man indeed his helpmate save? Be patient, lad, for they shall come to it. The dark side of the Force is passing strong, a path to varied possibilities, e'en if, by some, they are considered wrong. With all my might, these powers shall I seize. And here he mimes, uh, using the Force, through hand motions and incantations, and his wife rises as if from sleep. There ne'er was a Sith like unto me. The power over life and death is mine. Now come, my love, away, and let us flee. Forever thou art mine, and I am thine. 
they exit. Alas, the might of Plagius would not hold. Although with power he was plenty full, the thought of losing it did turn him cold. Though death he trumped, his fear he'd not control. My young apprentice, I did teach thee all. Thy mind doth hold the wisdom that I know. Your wisdom's light doth hold me in its thrall. My recompense shall bear an equal glow. He takes out a lightsaber and kills Darth Plagueis. The tragic tale of this Darth Plagueis ends. Upon a hopeful moral all should heed. To save your family, to save your friends. Tis possible, if you with care proceed. And that, my friends, is the tale of Darth Plagueis the Wise from William Shakespeare's Tragedy of the Sith's Revenge, Star Wars Part the Third, by Ian Dosher. Thank you very much. There it was. Did it sync perfectly? Perfectly, yeah. It's uncanny. There's so many points where it just crosses right over and my mind was blown. Weird hologram things flying out of water balls suspended in the air yeah. into other water balls or whatever it is suspended in the air. Yeah, it just pairs perfectly with that manipulation of midichlorians and, yeah, man, just the dark side. Who knew what incredible power it had? As clones and Jedi were fighting and dying, Palpatine was partying at a weird opera thing. Don't want to get political, though. <laughs> <laughs> Take from that what you will. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not in the UK, it might not mean much to you. So <laughs> message us and we'll tell you what it is. <laughs> or just read the news. Read the UK news. It's everywhere. Anyway, let us start with characters. To me, there's only really two character stories in this film, which is really weird considering how many characters there are. But Anakin is the obvious place to start because it is his story. It's about him becoming Darth Vader. And that is something that definitely happens in this film. But the operative question is, does it make sense? Does it sell his descent into the dark side? Do you believe it when it happens? Do you think it was earned? Or do you think it needed a lot of work? (laughs) I don't think it works very well. I think when you consider that we've got three films featuring mostly Anakin before he even becomes Darth Vader. Two really, because Phantom Menace does not count. He doesn't do anything. Well, you expect that there are supposed to be grains of what's going to happen, what his fate is going to be in that film. Maybe there aren't very many, but a good writer would have sown some of those seeds early on. The scene where he just shoves over another kid because he's just a mean child. Yeah. And so looking back across his whole sort of arc over the trilogy, he kind of comes and goes. He flashes examples of when he goes after the indigenous Tatooineers in Attack of the Clones. You're supposed to think, okay, well, he's flipping out on them. This is him sort of exhibiting all of his dark side tendencies because of the feelings he has for his mother, the feelings that he's supposed to have left behind as a Jedi. And then at the beginning of this film, you're presented with him and Obi-Wan as being, we're supposed to believe that they're the best of friends, as has been reported later on in later <laughs> In the films. opening crawl, Anakin and Obi-Wan are friends, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, and they're supposed to have gone on all these adventures and I suppose it's kind of dropped in dialogue from time to time. I'd rather have seen some of this stuff rather than being told about it. Well, here's something in my notes. Do you find the skipping of the entire Clone Wars a bit jarring because the last time we saw them, Anakin was Obi Wan's apprentice, and the Clone Wars is just beginning. And now he's a Jedi Knight. He's on the same level as Obi Wan, and the whole Clone Wars has happened. Yes. So we've missed out on years of development. Ended the Clone Wars have? Yeah, or ended the Clone Wars are about to. <laughs> yeah, it is strange. I was thinking about that watching this as well. It hadn't really occurred to me before so much but knowing now that there's so much additional material that covers that that i have not really delved into very much at all as uh, regular listeners to this podcast will know i kind of (laughs) restrict my viewing to the main movies in the mcu or in star wars i don't delve too deeply into the tv shows for better or worse because i think there's probably quite a lot of good material in there but yeah it's a bit strange not having that to rely on because as you say there's just this big gap and it feels as if kind of the whole point of the prequels from obi-wan's speech in star wars telling us about how great a star pilot luke's father was and how he was a good friend and how they fought 
beside each other in the Clone Wars. But you think, okay, there's a lot of material to tell us about this character. And I feel as if most of that doesn't even happen in the films that we're presented with. It's <laughs> the sort of conversations in between these interesting events that we get to see. Again, the very beginning of this, Anakin's presented with instructions from Palpatine to try and sway him towards the dark side, kill Dooku. And he's supposed to try and resist this pull, this evil influence on him. And he does for a bit, and then he doesn't, and then he does for a bit, and then he doesn't. <laughs> it's not as if it's a slide into the dark side. Are we supposed to take from that that he's conflicted over it? Or is it just because there's one scene where he's supposed to be good and there's one scene where he's supposed to exhibit bad until the point at which there's no turning back? Yeah, so I am coloured a bit by my perception of Anakin through watching The Clone Wars, which I was constantly pushing aside while I was re-watching this film. But I did put in my notes that skipping the whole Clone Wars is really jarring, because it is, and... It's because you waste the Phantom Menace with just Kid Anakin because nothing happens in that film. Nothing in that film has any significance to the events of the other two. And that's why the Machete Order is a suggested viewing order where you watch four, five, then two, three, and then Return of the Jedi because then two and three become flashbacks to fill in the backstory of Vader being Luke's father, spoilers, before you see the conclusion of it and mm-hmm. yeah it makes sense but you still have to watch two of the prequels which isn't great you don't want to do that but i feel like return of the jedi gives you more than enough information to follow what's going on so i don't need to do that which is great for return of the jedi but structurally i think phantom menace should have been anakin as a teenager you perhaps end it with or at least at some point during the film he becomes Obi-Wan's apprentice. Then you can play up the he's too old thing a bit better because he's a teenager. Then Attack of the Clones should have been set during the Clone Wars, give you a story through that and show you a bit of what went on during the Clone Wars and maybe show him becoming a Jedi Knight as well, which is depicted in the not-TV series Clone Wars. They made a series of shorts, I think between two and three, or maybe it was just after three came out, I'm not sure. But in that, it depicts Anakin getting appointed as a Jedi Knight after... He goes through the trials, so you see them. I feel like this is information that should be in the film. I remember being young, watching this the first time, and thinking, when they mentioned that, just some of the dialogue threw me, because I was like, all right, so Anakin's not Obi-Wan's apprentice anymore. Okay, that's weird. And somehow he's kept his marriage secret for however many years it's been. I don't know how they've managed that. My view has also changed about Anakin over the years, because initially I thought, when they were doing these films, he's just a bad guy. And he's always going to end up this way. That's changed a bit. I actually think that Anakin's a good guy who was led astray. And that's kind of what they're getting at here. There's things like he has a strong moral code. For example, when he kills Dooku, he says, I shouldn't have done that. It's not the Jedi way. And that Jedi way line is actually really important because that's why he attacks Mace Windu later on. Because Mace Windu betrays the Jedi way by saying, well, I'm going to kill Palpatine. Not an exact quote, but he's going to kill Palpatine where Anakin says, no, he should be put on trial. And there's a line that Anakin misses as well where Mace Windu says, the Jedi will need to take over the Senate to assure a peaceful transition. It's okay, they're just as bad then, but in different ways. (laughs) Because you can look at the Jedi and the Sith as two extremes. And that's what The Last Jedi gets at. And then they fail to pick up in The Rise of Skywalker where Luke realises, no, the Jedi and the Sith are two sides of the same coin. And I think we talked about it during The Last Jedi podcast, but the way to look at it is the Jedi are living in fear. They live in fear of the dark side. They live in fear of this whole aspect of this thing they've devoted their lives to. So they just close it off and ignore it. And any temptation associated with it just becomes their downfall, really. And that's why they're ultimately wiped out because... They fail to recognise that side of the Force. They fail to sense anything because they won't even go near it. And it ends up being their downfall. Even the thing about the prophecy being about bringing balance to the Force by getting rid of the Sith, that's not balance, that's monopoly. What you're doing is you're just creating a different monopoly. You're tipping the scales in a different direction. Mm. The interesting thing about Anakin is that he has questions about the way the Jedi do things that they are not able to answer, they're not willing to answer. And if he'd been picked up, they never establish in any of the films. I don't know what the expanded universe says about when kids are picked up and indoctrinated into the cult of the Jedi. Anakin's nine in Phantom Menace, isn't he? So it's before that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's when they're babies, I don't know. Maybe they just take babies and indoctrinate them. But they'll be raised to not ask those kinds of questions. So... They just accept blindly whatever's given to them. And then you have people like Qui-Gon, apparently, who is more reckless than others. He doesn't play by the rules, apparently, according to a little bit of The Phantom Menace gives you that hint. It's like, you'd be on the council if you weren't such a troublemaker. What makes him a troublemaker? The fact that he hangs around with Gungans and steals children. (laughs) It's a child-snatching Qui-Gon. So I can see what the film is getting at. It's getting at this whole idea of Anakin's faith in the Jedi has been shaken. 
And if you want to take something from Clone Wars, which I will for the purposes of this, his apprentice that isn't mentioned in this film, Ahsoka, she leaves the Jedi because she feels that they've let her down. So that will shake his faith in them a little bit as well at that point, and it does. He's left with more questions. So if this had been competently written, they could have really played into that. They could have really played into Anakin's this good guy that has lost faith in this society that he's been part of his entire life. And it's things like Palpatine playing on different aspects of his own insecurities. So he puts him in the position of being of the Jedi Council, knowing that they'll deny him the rank of Master, which is the right thing because he's just been put there. He's a figurehead. He's representing someone else. But him taking that personally is something that Palpatine obviously preys on. He kills Dooku at slight urging from Palpatine. So again, he's got that in him. I guess you're supposed to believe he's caught up in the adrenaline of the moment, but that doesn't really come across. Yeah, I just think that there isn't enough of it in the film. A lot of this is kind of extrapolated or comes from... That's headcanon, yeah, completely. Yeah, or it comes from other material, comes from supplementary material, comes from Clone Wars cartoons. I feel the same way about the theory about the arrogance or the complacence of the Jedi and that being their downfall. I mean, it is mentioned about how they've been blinded, but I don't feel like I've seen them particularly i mean they haven't done anything and maybe you could point to that as being evidence of their complacency or of their kind of lethargy in their position but i still feel as if that's people like us reading into what we're seeing rather than reacting to what we're seeing or being told in the film i feel the same way about the potential reasons for anakin's turn obviously his relationship with padme is a massive factor in it and that's what palpatine preys upon but the relationship itself is just badly written and badly performed badly directed none of it feels like what we're seeing should result in what actually happens so i feel as if so much of the interpretation of this is done not from what is actually presented in the film yeah definitely and there's little bits about the relationship with padme as well he turns to the dark side when he's at his lowest point or he's supposed to because well he thinks that palpatine is going to be killed and he feels like he needs them for padme to survive Obviously, that's a manipulation on Palpatine's part. Actually, I don't think it's ever mentioned in the film that he's the one generating those visions, but it's heavily implied. Just like it's heavily implied that Palpatine's actually his father, Hmm. or created him, because it was that whole, he could influence the midichlorians, because it's a good time to bring that up again. He believes that she and Obi-Wan have been conspiring against him. The fact that that happens so late in the film, maybe that could be evidence of him being blinded by the dark side, but also... I think it would have been more interesting if there had been groundwork laid for that throughout maybe the last two movies. His friend, his mentor, his master, he should have grown more and more suspicious of his involvement with Padme or Obi-Wan could have been attempting to shield Padme from Anakin's worst tendencies. But no, none of that happens. Everything's quite bland. No one has a relationship with Padme outside of Anakin. No one has a relationship with Obi-Wan outside of Anakin. Everything's kind of sealed off in these neat little relationship containers and then (laughs) by the end when obi-wan appears and you'd think okay this could be the culmination of anakin being paranoid and consumed with jealousy over something that he's either worked up in his own head or palpatine has kind of been turning the screw and getting him to snap finally none of that happens and you just think oh okay he has seen obi-wan and he he kind of jumps to the conclusion that that's what's going on well another thing in clone wars is that obi-wan in clone wars knows about anakin and padme there's a bit in one of the last episodes where anakin's going to sneak off to have a clandestine communication with her and that's not a euphemism that's actually what they're doing it's a holographic communication and obi-wan's like Anakin, tell Padme I said hello or give her my regards or whatever it is. He says something like that. I think they did that even though it breaches what this film suggests because it doesn't make sense for Obi-Wan not to know. They fight side by side routinely. He's not going to be able to hide that from him. And in Clone Wars, the series, Obi-Wan has a potential dalliance with a a Mandalorian political figure as well. Satine, I think her name is. There's a suggestion that they have a relationship or there's at least a definite attraction there. So there's all that and... It's all these things that the films don't play with. And somehow Padme, an in vogue political figure, has kept us marriage secret for, I don't know how many years it's been, since Attack of the Clones. But she somehow managed to do this. And Anakin somehow managed to do it. Despite the fact that he routinely stands around psychics who can sense stuff. (laughs) And he immediately runs to her after arriving back in Coruscant. No, no, she was hidden by the column. No one could see. Yeah, I suppose, yes. (laughs) A very well-rendered column for 2005. (laughs) And nobody was around, apart from all the people that were within earshot. (laughs) Echoey hall of whispers. Yeah, and the fact that when he goes home from the Jedi Temple, he mysteriously goes to 
Padme's apartment and doesn't leave until the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. So it's all muddled, completely muddled. And I can understand the subtext of what's going on, but the really jarring thing is it goes from, I need him to help me save Padme. I need to learn this power. Fair enough. That's a decent motivation. And the only way I can learn that power is by allying myself with him. Again, decent motivation. But how do you get from, I'm going to learn this thing from you too. I'm just going to kill children within minutes. Yeah. Okay, you're my apprentice now. I'm going to call you Darth Vader. Where did he get that name from? He's been waiting for that for a while. And go to the Jedi Temple and just kill everyone there. Everyone in there, just murder them. I've already had some business cards printed up. Take these with you. I was going to call the last guy that, but he fell off a bridge or something. So <laughs> and he even know. then says afterwards, he's been telling him, I know this guy, or I, I knew this guy. He's got this power. And then after he's dispatched Mace Windu, Palpatine says to him, I'm sure together we can work out the secret. <laughs> Wait a minute. I've just been missold on this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can figure it out. It was printed on the side of a bus. Yeah. <laughs> If you join the dark side, you'll get this power. It's like, oh no, and, I never said you would get it. And she is pregnant at the time, so presumably there's a bit of a ticking clock in terms of if she's going to die in childbirth, they've only got so long to work out this secret. <laughs> Better get cracking on it immediately. Nah, get yourself off to the Jedi Temple and slay a few younglings. How long is it going to take you to kill a bunch of younglings? And that's another thing that I always laugh at when I see this film, it's when they're trying to deliver really tragic dialogue about killing children and you can't hear the word youngling without laughing. It's just funny. <laughs> Obi-Wan's line about I saw a security hologram of Anakin killing younglings. Puts his hand to his face dramatically, probably stifling a laugh. Yeah, and then Padme later on says about him killing children, he's like, Obi-Wan's trying to turn you against me. But yeah, I did also kill younglings that's accurate i did do that yes fair dues i did kill those kids their blood is literally still in my lightsaber <laughs> the wound gets cauterized i suppose but yeah so i don't understand how you get it from there and the thing about clone wars that's colored me from that is clone wars anakin's not an idiot he is a fierce and competent leader and warrior and he is reckless but he's only reckless in the sense that he knows what he can get away with and everybody who follows him know that they're coming back from the mission he's well respected and stuff like that the Anakin that they tell you about in the original trilogy and so on is the Anakin in Clone Wars exactly and then suddenly he's this idiot he's just a complete moron in this film it's a real shame because the Clone Wars Anakin is really interesting and then you've got the my powers have doubled since our last encounter and <laughs> He'd actually had many encounters with Dooku over the years, plus other Force users such as Dooku's apprentice Ventress, Darth Maul, who comes back with his robot legs, and some other Force users as well. So you could argue that Clone Wars just completely destroys the canon of this film in a lot of ways, but I don't really mind because it's better. I always felt like the last season of Clone Wars should have just been a remake of this, but better. But it's not. And now that Lucas has sold off Star Wars, it's unlikely that it'll go back and rewritten or special editioned to cover up some of those inconsistencies yeah well i think the condition of the sale was that the films he made remain intact so that has to be the basis of the canon right i mean he'll die at some point and then they'll just throw that out the window and reboot the thing or whatever <laughs> it'll happen eventually yeah so anakin's turn not great and the thing about darth vader actually and this never occurred to me before this viewing but the name obviously the name means father supposedly it was a clue all along and it's probably just picked because it sounded cool but then they managed to add it all in but wouldn't it be more interesting if that was a name he chose to sort of wear his pain on his sleeve after he thinks he killed padme and his child yeah it's a bit of an aha moment are you supposed to think oh he's been dubbed darth vader now where does he get the name from just Palpatine gives it to him, that's all. Yeah, it's not special at all. It's just, okay, that's it. And yeah, you're right. If they were going to rewrite where the name came from, I agree with you. It probably just sounded cool when the character was created originally because at that point there was probably no plan for him to be Luke's father. And it's coincidence that in Dutch or whatever it means father. Yeah, I think it would have been better if that had been tied up somehow, but instead it's just kind of throwaway. And is it all that impressive when it happens? You're now Darth Vader. You're now Lord Vader. And I was thinking, Lord of what? <laughs> it's like buying a title online or something. You have to call me Lord now. Right, but why? <laughs> You're Dark Lord of the Sith, because I say so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the Sith ranking is, really, because Sidious is still Sidious, isn't he? And Darth mm. Sidious, even. And he only goes by Emperor later on when he gets to declare himself the Emperor. Because yeah. in the Jedi, there's Padawan, there's Knight, and then there's Master. So he's just instantly a Lord. Yeah, instantly a Lord. 
But yeah, I don't know. I think that when he does actually get to do less of the broody teenager stuff and less of the poorly written romantic dialogue, Christensen does get to emote a bit, which is good because he hasn't really been able to do that. He's been warned about giving into his feelings all this time and to give him is due. When he's being melodramatic and angry at the end and trying to present this descent to the dark side that we're discussing, I do like it. I think, fair enough, he's finally getting to do something. I'm sure people could criticise the performance, but I actually think it stands out amongst the rest of his fairly wooden performance. (laughs) Which is damning with faint praise, but I think, fine, give him a go. He can at least start shouting at Padme and at Obi-Wan at the end and kind of skulking around on Mustafar. He's slain the Separatist leaders and there's a few weird shots where he just sort of turns to the camera and shows weird looking eyes and stuff with his contact lenses yeah yeah what's going on here he's just kind of sulking it doesn't even really progress the story at all he's done what he was sent there to do and now he just has to wait for Padme and Obi-Wan to show up so he's just kind of looking mean and menacing well Palpatine tells him to go murder those guys and then wait for further instructions doesn't he so that's what he does but that's counter to what Anakin would do because if Obi-Wan said go kill all those guys. Maybe Obi-Wan wouldn't tell him to do that, but (laughs) if Obi-Wan said to him, go to this planet and do this. Go and liberate those civilians by killing killing all those guys. By killing the bad guys, although that's kind of what you're doing there or not. There is an argument that the Separatists were the right side all along, and Padme says it in this film, but I talked about this during the Attack of the Clones podcast. I think that they should have leaned into Dooku being the one who was right in all this. Dooku could have been the one that set up the Separatists because he believed the Republic was corrupt and so on, but that's not really what happens, which is a bit of a shame. He's just another cog in the Palpatine machine, which is really annoying because it means that no one except Palpatine has any agency. Yeah, and in a way, with the way that the sequel trilogy ended up, it's almost as if nothing mattered all that much because Palpatine was behind everything all the time. So whatever the menace was, Phantom or otherwise, it was always Palpatine. (laughs) The Separatists were always Palpatine. The Republic was always Palpatine. The Empire was Palpatine. Just so muddled. And I agree with you. I think that if there were any kind of opposition or if anyone else had stood up and said no we're presenting this alternative viewpoint and then Anakin had somehow got drawn into that as a soldier of Palpatine's will it could have been so much better instead of the oh Palpatine did it all and every antagonist was doing Palpatine's bidding Anakin was doing Palpatine's bidding Palpatine knew what was going on at all times somehow managing to engineer events that you couldn't possibly know what the outcome was going to be or how people (laughs) were going to behave yeah Because I really like the idea of Dooku being this Jedi who leaves the Jedi Order because he recognises that they're idiots and that they won't pay attention to what's right in front of them. There is even that scene in Attack of the Clones where he goes up to Obi-Wan and says, there's a Sith at the head of the Senate and this clone army is all in service of building this army and seizing power and whatever. It's plain as a nose on your face. It's right there. Qui-Gon saw it too, but unfortunately he's dead. And you should join me because I'm on the right side here. And then Dooku could end up being killed to silence him, in effect. And yep. you can even play into that at the start of this film, where it's like, look, I've captured the Sith Lord. He's sitting right there. And then Palpatine's sitting in his throne chair, because that's what you do at a prisoner, apparently. You just tie them up on a throne. <laughs> well, it's got to look like the end of Return of the Jedi, so... He might be a prisoner, but the guy still commands respect. He still needs a decent <laughs> chair. <laughs> a swivel chair that he can use. Put him in Chancellor Prison. Yeah, I can't be a Sith Lord. I'm sitting in this chair. If I was like a Sith Lord, don't you think I would escape? Yeah, he's got a point. Because we're Jedi, we're idiots. And that could be how Palpatine managed to seize power because he identified this major weakness in the Jedi that they were just incapable of imagining a scenario where they could be overrun and destroyed. But Sith Lords are their speciality. Yeah, apparently. But in order for that scenario to work, to maintain his credibility, Yoda has to already be retired. He has to already not be around. Because otherwise, it's yeah, I didn't see it coming either. Oops. Bad am I? Bad am I. Care, I do not. <laughs> He's already chilling on Dagobah. He's been there the whole time. They just go and visit him occasionally. I'll rewrite the trilogy. No, I'm not going to do that. You don't have enough time for all that stuff. But yeah, Anakin just waiting there for instructions to look back to that thing I started 10 minutes ago is counter to his personality. Because like I said, if Obi-Wan told him to do that, he would just get bored and go off and do something else. Yeah. But it gives him the ability to kind of stalk around moodily, so... Yeah, just stand there in the middle of a lava planet and just be like, this is a place to go. I think I'll build a house here pretty soon. Yeah, looks like a good spot for a castle. God, the Mustafar castle. Is that in the trailer for Obi-Wan Kenobi? I'm not sure. No, it's the Inquisitor training ground. I don't think the castle's Yeah, there. I don't think so. The Inquisitors, what are they? We'll never find out. Although that alien on the planet that Obi-Wan goes to is the same species as what the Grand Inquisitor is supposed to be, that they have 
royally mucked up in the Obi-Wan trailer. You could do it with makeup like 22 years ago, so why aren't you doing it now? I don't know if he was CGI or not. I think it was a combination thereof. I'm not sure. Mm. Anyway, besides the point, you were talking about the scene where Hayden Christensen actually got to have a go at Emotin, however poorly, where he was arguing with Obi-Wan. And I do think that argument is interesting, although it's very badly done. Because you've got that line where he says, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil, in response to Chancellor Palpatine is evil. And Anakin has a point, but it's a point not explored, because I can understand why he sees the Jedi have betrayed everything that they're supposed to stand for. Because he just saw Mace Windu try to kill a guy without trial, which might be something that Anakin really believes in. You don't know, but there is certainly a hint that a moral code that's not being followed. So, I mean, my point of view is the Jedi are just as bad as the Sith. I saw a Jedi being what I can perceive as evil. Also, there were three dead Jedi just in the doorway that I had to step over <laughs> yeah. that were probably evil as well. Yeah, who didn't have the decency to go and fade into the Force like others. <laughs> there's that. But there's also the bit earlier where Yoda essentially dismisses his concerns about his feelings Mm -hmm. because he says someone I care about is going to be hurt or might die and Yoda's like well the best thing to do is just not care about anyone and then you'll be fine (laughs) just ignore it just chill bro that's the Jedi way just don't care about anyone or anything (laughs) you'll live longer it'll be much easier (laughs) so that's a bit stupid on Yoda's part as well which again he picks up in The Last Jedi a bit where he points out yeah okay we failed it's okay. I'm a ghost. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got in a Jedi heaven, so I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> Must have done all, something right. That's all that's important. Apparently, it just took 30 years of exile to just reset the, the karma card. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and the other bit that I've got a note of is when Obi-Wan says, only a Sith deals in absolutes, which is in itself an absolute. <laughs> Revealing himself to be a secret Sith. All along, yeah. Yep. Where's Jar Jar and all this? What's he up to? To pulling Palpatine strings, that's what he's doing. When he said Sith Lords are speciality, he might have been talking in the royal we and <laughs> revealing himself as a Sith. They are our speciality. Perhaps, yeah. Obi-Wan kind of has nothing to do in this film, weirdly. Because my only note in the agenda is he's there, but does he have an impact on the plot? I mean, he does, because he defeats Anakin, and he's the one that figures out, and he's one of the survivors. He survives through dumb luck, though. He survives because the clones miss, funnily enough. <laughs> Even though they're not stormtroopers, they still miss. But it's the only time they miss. They're pretty good shots otherwise. Yeah, they execute Order 66 quite well. Yeah. I mean, there's so many blaster bolts flying around that they couldn't not hit something. But no, the clones are competent. And Obi-Wan's on his weird giant iguana thing. The beast of burden they has. He deals with the diversion that is General Grievous. Is that just a way of bolstering the runtime, I wonder? General Grievous was created to sell toys. That's why he was created. He was also in that animation that I talked about, the one that isn't the Clone Wars CGI series. Did he appear much in the Clone Wars TV show? He does early on, yeah. Because Anakin, he talks as if they've never met before, but they have. Yeah, because I was getting the impression I'd missed so much by not watching The Clone Wars. Watching Revenge of the Sith this time, I was thinking, I do feel as if I've just skipped a whole lot about why he's there, what he does, what the whole point is. He's the leader of the droid army. What more do you need? (laughs) (laughs) But then they have to get rid of him and that'll be the end of the war. But is it... (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, when they kill the general, apparently the troops can't function anymore. <laughs> There's no others. There isn't a backup general. There isn't a chain of command anywhere. Yeah. Newt Gunray can't command the troops after that. <laughs> Him coughing and wheezing isn't done in the Clone Wars TV show. It's done in the Clone Wars animation. No, the other animation, the two, I don't think they're quite feature length. They're all right, actually. They're worth watching. As a bit of an aside, I suppose. There's some really cool stuff in it. Mace Windu just beating the crap out of droids. <laughs> just punching them. <laughs> I think it's Mace Windu that's the one that squeezes his heart or his lungs and that's why he coughs and wheezes because when you pick up at the point of the Clone Wars show it's after Anakin's a Jedi Knight and so on so it's after some of that Mm. although that animation it ends at the start of the Battle of Coruscant so it jumps back and forth but the Clone Wars CGI show is the last couple of years of the Clone Wars really I think it's kind of squishy in terms of its timeline it jumps around a lot but it's set quite late on in it when a lot of stuff's already happened. It's so you can get Anakin being a master to an apprentice and so on. Competent, yeah. Yeah. An apprentice that would never be mentioned in film. She does appear in Rise of Skywalker. Her voice does, Ahsoka's. (laughs) Yeah, but you'd think if you had an apprentice that you fought alongside or that you trained who then left and didn't appear in Revenge of the Sith, maybe there'd be some 
mention of that, but no. Yeah, he had just spoken to her just before the Battle of Coruscant as well, according <laughs> to that show. And then during those last couple of episodes, I did a podcast on it actually, yeah, a while ago. But during those last couple of episodes, there's a bit where Ahsoka learns that Anakin's turned into Darth Vader. And then when they get to the point in Star Wars Rebels, which is the sequel show to Clone Wars, there's a point where Ahsoka and Vader fight, which actually has more meaning to it than the Luke and Vader fight because there is actually that relationship that you can <laughs> watch play out. Oh, what a confusing mess. Yeah, it kind of is. And it makes no difference to this film because Ahsoka wasn't conceived of when this film was made. Right. <laughs> she was a later edition. So you have to sort of crowbar her in emotionally here, which doesn't work. Because, like you say, there's no mention of her, mm-hmm. which is a bit of a shame. Because she's a great character. She's one of the best characters in Star Wars. And you'll have seen her in The Mandalorian, played by Rosario Dawson, will not you? Yeah, but it wasn't something I was anticipating. I know that her appearance was highly anticipated because of the love for the character that has built up. I have none of that, really. I mean, it was cool because I like Rosario Dawson and I think the character looks cool. I don't really know anything about Ahsoka. <laughs> I don't like Rosario Dawson's Ahsoka, but that's another story for another time. So Obi-Wan, what does he do in this film? Nothing, really. Kills Grievous, shoots him with a gun, and then says, so uncivilised. No, ranged weapons are all right. (laughs) It's good to have one. Yes, it's just another way of sticking a bit of fan service in, I suppose, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, in that same sequence he says, hello there, and so (laughs) uncivilised. (laughs) These films are at least good for the memes that came from them. Yeah, it was after he dropped his lightsaber, though. Something they gave Anakin a really hard time about in the last film. And there are a lot of lightsabers being dropped in this movie. There is, especially from those younglings. (laughs) Yeah, I hope one of them got at least a lick in, got to hit his robot arm or something. (laughs) Singed his cape. Yeah, could have done. But yeah, Obi-Wan, yeah, other than the final battle, as I said, he doesn't even really have that potential love triangle. It's probably been suggested before and i have suggested it today already that it would have been a better storyline if that had been more involved but yeah he shows up when he needs to he says he doesn't want to fight anakin he wants to go and fight palpatine but he's denied that opportunity i don't know why yoda and obi-wan don't go together anakin ain't going anywhere you can go kill the emperor then go kill him he can watch the security footage that i guess if it was readily available or if palpatine's office had cameras in it and anyone could see this then they could prove that he's evil and he's a sith lord and (laughs) possibly get people to turn against him but nah that's just for them to see get a little bit emotional about and then go off in their separate ways there'd be a police inquiry he would face a fixed penalty and then he would get on with the job yeah that's all that would happen that's what people want from their politicians he's apologized it's fine did he even apologize (laughs) yeah he was like I've been left scarred and deformed by all this partying I've been doing. (laughs) Oh no, that was something else. I actually love that speech. It hits differently. We've joked about it, but it really hits differently now because at the time, thinking about how ridiculous it is that people would just accept this guy just seizing power here. And (laughs) now we're looking at in our world where we saw how easily that happened. Not quite to the point that the great British Empire has come back, but we've seen an erosion of freedoms over the last couple of years, whether that be for a justifiable reason or not, we have seen it. And we have seen how reluctant those who have the power to restrict those freedoms are to give it up. And now looking at it and watching him just get up in front of the Senate, be completely honest and say, you know what, democracy, screw that. Let us reform the Republic into an empire. Everybody cheers, except Padme and Jimmy Smits. They're both sitting there like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. (laughs) <laughs> and everyone is just cheering but yeah it's i was attacked by the jedi they left me scarred and deformed and don't worry they're all dead now so let's move on with that mass murder was definitely the right reaction to that but now we're an empire so democracy's gone isn't that great you won't have to turn up to these meetings anymore and vote on stuff <laughs> do you think the voters of naboo and alderaan are just like it doesn't matter who we vote into the senate there's just these other star systems that constantly vote for palpatine <laughs> and his party and when will we be free <laughs> I think that Naboo should have been Alderaan to begin with because then it gives you an emotional connection to that planet when it gets blown up. It doesn't make sense for the different planets <laughs> yeah. because Naboo's not important after these films. No, it's not, but central to this and then forgotten about. But yes, you do get to see a little bit of Alderaan. Oh, that's what was so brutally destroyed. That's that backdrop that has almost nothing in it. Cool. Great to see as 
<laughs> Jimmy Smith's and his wife kind of steal a child. Green and hilly. Yeah, looks all right. You can probably see one of those hills kind of exploding out after it's been vaporized by the Death Star. Be a shame if someone reduced it to slag. Yeah, that'd be a problem. So yeah, Obi Wan doesn't really do much. Palpatine. I would say he's one of the more focal characters. He's the only other character that has really anything to do in this film of any significance. And the ringleader and all this, the way he manipulates Anakin, both subtly and overtly, as my notes say. He does it both ways. There's a couple of points where he's just kind of goading him in a slight direction. And there's other points where he's like, I'm a Sith, but you haven't figured it out for some reason. The Darth Plagueis bit, he's basically saying, I am a Sith. How else would I know this story? Or don't try and save... Obi-Wan from this crashing ship. There's no time. (laughs) Yeah. Obi-Wan just gets knocked out for some reason. He seems to be all right, says Anakin, after just looking at him. (laughs) It's going to be okay. Can you just help me help him up? No, no, no. Leave him, leave him, leave him. That's not an evil thing to say at all. Yeah. Also, why are you carrying him? You can use the force. (laughs) Just carry him with the force. Apparently size matters not, but it still looks like it's heavy when you're lifting stuff. Yes. Takes concentration and effort. Mental effort. Yeah, and they were too busy navigating a ship that was turning upside down and watching R2's little comedy hijinks as he <laughs> fights battle droids. Shameful. <laughs> no loose wire jokes. The first and last time you'll ever hear reference to that. That doesn't happen in Clone Wars either. You've not got an ongoing character beat where Obi-Wan just keeps making fun of R2-D2. There is a point where they have to go find R2-D2 because Anakin hasn't bothered to erase his memory like they're supposed to with their droids. So there's a bunch of like Republic secrets in this R2 unit that could just be found. There's an episode, there's two episodes, I think, where that happens. They just don't take data security seriously. No, I don't think R2 ever forgets anything, though. I think he's aware of everything that's going on. An elephant or an astromech droid never forgets. His hard drive is not yet full. <laughs> Obi-Wan forgets, though. Or pretend he doesn't know. I don't know if Obi-Wan's lying or senile. I'm not sure which that is. Maybe the show will explain. Which do you think it is? Lying or senile? Uh, senile. I'm going to plump for senile. Good call. Han Solo calls him senile, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm going to pretend that I remembered that. Let's hope the old man got the tractor beam out of commission and stuff. Just constantly goading him. Just constantly mm. making fun of him. Ben is a great man. This man that I met like two hours ago. <laughs> I'm just regurgitating family guy gags now, aren't I? That's all I'm doing. But yeah, it's Palpatine. The way he sees his power, they make some reference to they're voting on more emergency powers when the war's almost over. And people comment, it might be Mace Windu, it might be other people comment, that's probably not a good idea. And how do we know he'll give up the power when we kill General Grievous? I don't know, but we're not going to really do anything about that. I've read or seen somewhere, I believe that this is all George Lucas's attempt at injecting a bit of real world politics. As we've already been discussing this, some 2022 politics, this is turn of the millennium post 9-11 Patriot Act type mm. politics, I think, getting injected into Star Wars here. And yeah, I think in more accomplished hands, it might have been a more interesting story, but you can see the parallels there and it's kind of clumsily done. But yes, emergency powers, but how do we know when they're ever going to be relinquished and obviously, when you've got a shriveled monster at the head of your Senate, he's going to hang on to those powers for as long as he can. Yeah, until his third or fourth death, I suppose. Yeah. We don't know how many times he actually gets killed. Well, at least twice. Or did he ever get killed at all? They don't even explain how he's back. Oh, yes, that all has to happen off screen as well. <laughs> yeah, we don't need anything. Somehow, Palpatine has survived. That's the only explanation you get. Oh, somehow, cool. But it's a shame, because... I think he is one of the more expressive characters in all of this. Oh, he's having a blast here. He's the only one having fun, really. He's just going nuts. It's brilliant. Yeah. Plenty of great gurning when he's transforming into putty face. (laughs) All the sort of unlimited power type stuff is pretty great. And then the distortion on his voice after he anoints Anakin as Darth Vader. That's quite funny. Mm, Yeah. But yeah, the Patriot Act stuff... That's obviously a parallel. And I mentioned during the Phantom Menace podcast, it was immensely clever, so I'm going to bring it up again, that it was an interesting look at the world at the time that the film was made because it's the late 90s. We're all naive and think everything's fine. We're on a good level pegging. The world's all right. Whereas just underneath that is the reality of everything's about to collapse. Everything's about to go to pot. Everything's actually broken and you don't realise it yet because you haven't been made aware of it yet. So... You can see that through line as opposed to the prequels, the Republic at War, and then 
the seizing of power and then everything being manipulated in such a way. And there's nothing about Palpatine awarding... Well, no, I suppose there is. Because he's awarding droid-making contracts to all his mates to keep the war going. (laughs) Yes, there's just corruption everywhere. Yeah, or in one place, really. It all goes back to him, but because he's got his fingers in so many pies, this corruption and this evil spreads throughout the whole galaxy. Yeah, you have to wonder if anybody who isn't devout to the Force suddenly turns around and is like, hang on, we're letting the whole galaxy go to ruin because of some weird wizards fighting over stuff. (laughs) Speaking of people that shouldn't have a lightsaber, I don't think Palpatine should have a lightsaber. No, although his character in the Lego games was very fun to control because you could do that spinny jump. I enjoyed playing as him, even with a lightsaber, because you need a lightsaber to be able to smash up those bricks quite well. But then that's a Lego game and that's not this, so... (laughs) Also, when you control him, he cackles all the time, which got really annoying after a minute oh, or two. I like that. <laughs> yeah, he had a lightsaber. Even in Return of the Jedi, because you fight him as Vader, don't you? Or with Vader, and he has a lightsaber there. Hmm. I just think him and Yoda shouldn't have lightsabers, because they're above it, they're beyond it, but they do. Everybody needs a lightsaber. Yeah, it's a good trilogy for lightsabers. He has the mechanical release on his sleeve as well, doesn't he? Yeah, he's like a sort of Assassin's Creed of lightsabers. <laughs> yeah. His hidden blade he sneaks up behind people and just stabs them (laughs) now palpatine's the kind of guy that would say i'm gonna stab you and then he would do it (laughs) i like him in this i think he he's really good his fight with yoda is really boring though yeah and again that was the sort of thing that i'd convinced myself that i liked as i said earlier it was action so as i was watching this i was preferring all the times where people aren't talking (laughs) so originally they're just chucking stuff at each other and kind of flipping around and things sometimes not all that gracefully like when he falls over the chair and i'm like that shot looks like they could have done that better but it was left in the movie but yes unnecessary action for action's sake i think the preamble was quite funny when yoda walks in and just slams the two guards against the wall Mm -hmm. that was really cool that's the kind of stuff you should see yoda doing rather than lightsaber and then the my little green friend oh Oh, what a line he makes fun of Palpatine as well. He makes a remark at his expense about being the Emperor, doesn't he? What bit was that? I can't remember the exact line. He says something about him being the Emperor as if to say, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm here to overthrow you. (laughs) Or throw you over, whichever comes first. (laughs) I noticed you just got a new window put in. It'd be a shame if someone smashed it and threw you out of it. Of course, according to Samuel Jackson, Mace Window's still out there. Mace Window. Mace Window. Defenestrated. That's how he died. Yeah, well, plenty of characters have fallen down shafts and been resurrected or out windows to come back with spider legs or something. (laughs) I suppose we'll talk a bit more about Palpatine in relation to the story, because he has very one note. He's just evil. I mean, he's deliciously evil, but he's just evil. Yeah, and he doesn't feature so heavily that you get fed up with it. I think he's sprinkled throughout, and his theatrics and stuff are funny and enjoyable enough and not overdone to the point where you get sick of it. So I think he's one of the actors who comes out of this fairly unscathed. Yeah, as long as he plays the Emperor for the rest of his life. Yeah, and it seems like they're going to keep giving him opportunities to do so. (laughs) I love it when Anakin rumbles him. And then it's like, what are you going to do about it? And then he lets him leave and he just sits in his office the whole time. He doesn't do anything. I guess he knows he's won at that point or feels like he knows he's won. He's always foreseeing things, isn't he? Was Rise of Skywalker his plan all along? Was it always intended to end up in that way? Let's not talk about that. (laughs) It's difficult to figure out because he sees the future, but then he doesn't see his own downfall. Yeah, I think we've gone over it a few times just about how silly of a story it is that he's behind everything for three movies and all of this is him tinkering away with all these different pieces on his chessboard he can see the whole thing he can just make everyone do what he wants and it's all going to end up with him in charge you have to wonder how natalie portman fell about being this film because she has nothing to do really (laughs) (laughs) she's in some of it it's a contractual thing she has to be there but they didn't write her anything to do she's pregnant and then she gets strangled and that's about it Although I will say the scene just before Anakin goes to turn to the dark side where they're in separate locations and it's the haunting music and I know he's talking about the unconvincing CGI but I thought that the visual of Coruscant just going about its day while well, there was this darkness underneath it that the unsuspecting people in their flying cars didn't know about. 
<laughs> stuff like that. That's a really well done bit. There's no dialogue in it, which saves it, I think. So there's no crappy dialogue and it's just emotion. Yeah, I agree. I've got that as a note as well, that that was one of the things I liked most about watching it this time around. Again, it's probably because of that lack of dialogue. I've always liked the score in Star Wars. It's always one of the things that whenever I'm looking for a redeeming feature or if there's something that I like the best or something that stuck with me, the music is usually what I fall back on and it's probably call that out on every episode we do i agree yeah i think that the visuals of that bit the emotion of them being separated but kind of looking out towards each other i'm not sure how much they're aware that that's happening but i guess for this sort of emotion of the scene you're supposed to feel like they're aware of each other's presence out there and the distance between them as characters and yeah the lack of dialogue means that it can't be ruined by any clunky romantic or non-romantic bs i'm glad that you picked up on that because that was one of the things i really liked changes in the air you could feel it at that moment really impressive bit of work and a lot of it would have been done by the post-production people because it's largely based on cgi visuals you have the cuts to the actors but there's a lot of here's coruscant the sunset and like the day is ending the republic is ending that kind of stuff so it's quite symbolic yeah and you get more of a feeling of place than you do when people are just kind of walking and talking in corridors that aren't ever really describing anything about what's happening there they could be the corridors of power they could be the corridors of the jedi temple or some hangar bays and stuff that you see people walking through but it doesn't really tell you anything about what it's like to be there they're just backdrops Hmm. whereas i agree that even though it's just a city in the background you're actually feeling like you're seeing something of the planet or something of the setting more than just enclosed space number 451 yeah and then later when the place is on fire you can sense the chaos yeah, and you've had that sort of geography of it all kind of laid out for you. And you can, yeah, as you say, you can see the smoke rising. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good stuff, actually. Shame it's in this film. But yeah, the storytelling, as you started to point out there, is very much that. It's a collection of people in unremarkable, sparsely decorated, because it's easier to animate rooms, <laughs> sitting and talking, or standing and talking, or walking slowly and talking. And it's weird how it kills the urgency. For example, you've got the scene where Anakin says, Palpatine's a Sith Lord, we should probably go do something about it. And Mace Windu says, stay here, I'll go deal with that. And then he just casually walks off. Yep. No hurry whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if that's part of the direction. It's like, no, we only have so much set to play with here, so you have to leave, but do it slowly. This is so the animators can keep it, I don't know. It's just really bizarre how it's, they'll say something like, we've got to get here right now, and then... Just a casual saunter off. Yeah, it's strange. There are examples on YouTube of how all of the important decisions or conversations that happen in the film are done on sofas. And you'd think, I'm watching an intergalactic space opera with magical wizards and all kinds of aliens in it. And yet it's so mundane that I can relate because I sit on sofas as well. I have conversations. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be taken away. I want to be whisked away and seeing starfighters fly down trenches and blow up battle stations and stuff. <laughs> I don't want to see people sitting and talking on sofas. I just don't know how you end up at this. When you've got George Lucas, who created the whole thing, seemed so inspired with the original trilogy and it just feels like such a letdown to arrive at this. Yeah, it's easy to just get any old crap and stick it in a room though when you're dressing a set isn't it I don't want to diminish set dressers because they do great work they make you feel like a location's real yeah but it's much easier to let's find some stuff that looks a bit weird and and pop it in the sci-fi setting I suppose it should be easier for animators because you can make it from the ground up but then it's more work to do especially if you're spending a lot of time in that location you have to animate around it and deal with the characters passing in front of it and stuff but yeah it's weird that Palpatine's desk that he's presumably sat at every day for years doesn't have any knickknacks on it or anything. <laughs> doesn't have a Sith holocron on his desk as a paperweight, that kind of stuff. <laughs> doesn't have any executive toys, you know, Newton's cradle or anything. Yeah, he's just sitting there playing with his Sith holocron. It's like, I wonder if there's a Sith Lord in the charge of the Senate and this holocron sitting there. There was one video I watched on YouTube. There's plenty of criticism on YouTube of this movie. I can't remember which one it was, but it actually went as far as praising a scene in which Anakin and Padme were having a conversation and she was packing to go home or she was going to Naboo. It was saying, normally it's just shot, reverse shot of people talking, but in this, she's actually got some business to do. And I think, how can you make a multi-million dollar movie and not 
have anything for the characters to be doing walking talking sitting talking standing talking nobody does anything how is this possible it wasn't red letter media was it mr plinkett wasn't that one was it it might have been that one, that's yeah. a celebrated one i'm really restraining myself from just copying his really insightful points because it's difficult not to because he makes such really good ones and yeah he does it with a bit of a laugh it is something i even noticed back then it's just this boring camera work i'm not suggesting that the camera should be doing somersaults or whatever but yeah at padme packing for example in the acting biz they call that their business mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just something they're doing while the scene is playing and it's supposed to not be important, but it gives you that layer of reality, doesn't it? Because they are just, they're doing something. It's just crazy that that should be remarkable amongst all these scenes where nobody does anything. <laughs> yeah. I suppose in Attack of the Clones, you had Anakin picking stuff up with the Force and whatever, just idly. Yeah. Floating fruit across a table. Even in Attack of the Clones, they were filming in wherever they were filming for Naboo. So those were actual locations with stuff in them. Lake Como, I think. Whereas in this, it is just the Senate and the Jedi Temple and various apartments on Coruscant and offices. You don't really go anywhere else. Yes, which is to the detriment of the movie. I mean, Mustafar looks used, I suppose. Yeah, there's some kind of facility there, although it's pretty empty. Is it entirely droid Howard, is that why there's no one there? Yeah, but the control room, it's busy, it looks dirty and so on. It's classic Star Wars design, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The lived and used quality to the universe. And you get a sense of that in some things. You see on some of the speeders and whatever, there's scorch marks on the engines and things. So you do get a sense of that lived in reality. I think that's the CGI animators just doing that, though, to give you a bit of extra stuff. Even the clone armor, you can see it's decorated and dinged and so on. Yeah, and those sequences our welcome relief from what we've just been talking about, (laughs) the more boring aspects. But that was a big thing in the Clone Wars animated show as well. The clones found their own identity through like haircuts and decorating their armour and things like that. They would have different personalities. They would define themselves in some way, which you don't get here. You get one that's Obi-Wan's friend, Cody, Commander Cody. Commander Cody. Who then tries to kill him, which is a shame, I suppose. So much that's sterile about these as we've talked about the environments the dialogue the fact that you've got disposable armies on both sides clones who are never really given any characterization despite in animations and stuff they explore that and then droids who again you don't care if they're just getting blasted away doesn't matter from the very beginning from the phantom menace the droid army was just always something that didn't sit right with me because from the original trilogy the stormtroopers even though they were faceless they were still scary felt like they had some kind of drive or menace or something whereas this just feels like this is the sort of thing we've talked about when you've got a kid playing with action figures just smashing them against each other there's nothing more than just this guy's fighting this guy this guy's blasting that guy i don't know who any of them are i applaud them for introducing stories that develop clones with personalities but because they are clones they're just cannon fodder yeah and the clone wars show gets into that without really getting into it because if you get into it too far the whole premise falls apart right if the jedi suddenly question we're friends with these guys can we really be leading them to their deaths i suppose because we don't have any other soldiers but i suppose it's the same as leading any army if you're a general or leading an army then you have to make those kinds of decisions whether they're clones or not you're still sending people into their deaths whereas droids are a bit neater in that respect and again in the clone war show it is actually in here that the droids are stupid yeah and speak with sort of childish cadence why would you program a droid to do that i always got the impression that it was george lucas sanitizing these movies instead of there being individuals under that armor thinking feeling caring humans or whatever species they are you could argue that the original movies are for kids as well but because he wants this to be accessible to children there has to be this departure between the violence and between people that are having violence inflicted upon them so you've got disposable robots and disposable clones even though these movies feature dismemberment and some fairly violent things happening to people main characters i don't understand why a certain level of violence seems unacceptable to him in movies that have wars in the title. Yeah. <laughs> but then dismemberment and burning up in lakes of lava can happen. Well, conceptually, the stormtroopers, they wore full body armor so that you could dehumanize them. Yeah. Fine. I suppose you still have the officers. Well, I don't know if you ever see any of them die. And then they just don't dwell on the fact that Luke Skywalker probably killed thousands if not tens of thousands of innocent people when he blew up the Death Star. Yes. There was just people on there. It might have been Imperial officers' families. We don't know. Potentially prisoners of war as well. (laughs) Definitely prisoners, yeah. It's fine. 
we'll just have to deal with that. You don't ever see Luke haunted by the Collateral tens of thousands damage. of people he murdered <laughs> just by blowing up the Death Star. Yeah. It's something that they've picked up on in Robot Chicken and so on. It's the janitors on the Death Star, all those kinds of people. These people that are just in the Empire because they're in the Empire. There's nothing else to do. You either take up a position or, well, there is no choice. Even Han Solo was joining the Empire, remember that? And Luke was going to. He wanted to go to the Academy. Yeah, so he would have been a TIE fighter pilot. I wonder if they've ever done that. What if scenario where Luke gets to do that and then meets Vader that way? (laughs) (laughs) Vader's like, Skywalker, interesting. Wonder if any relation. I thought I killed my child, but obviously not. Because <laughs> there's only one Skywalker in the galaxy, other than me. It's this guy. <laughs> yeah, the droid has been stupid. In the Clone Wars show, they're formidable because there's a lot of them, but they often exploit the fact that they're idiots, that they've been programmed to be stupid. And they don't explain why. It's just because it's a kid's show, really. Let's have a laugh at the droids. One falls off a cliff and its pal just shouts, get back here, that kind of stuff. Even the super battle droids in this one are idiots, which is funny. I can get it with the garden variety battle droid but not with the super battle droid they're supposed to be a bigger deal but r2 just covers them in oil and sets fire to them marketed as such but really just as incompetent as the rest yeah and you've got the weird lightsaber resistant droids that can fight while headless there's those ones too they don't say anything though Mm. yeah so it's interesting the action stuff let's just talk about that now then while we're at it what did you think of the set pieces here? I've got notes on the major ones. So you've got the opening space battle, etc., because it's not just a space battle. Obi-Wan versus Grievous. There's some quick stuff here and there. Anakin versus Obi-Wan. Yoda versus Palpatine. We've already talked about how boring Yoda versus Palpatine is, except from the preamble, which is more fun. I really like the opening sequence. That's a great opening. How it transitions from the space battle to the inside of Grievous' ship to the lightsaber fight, brief as it may be, to the crash sequence. I think that's a really well-built set piece that just builds and builds and builds until it ends yeah it's pretty spectacular and it provides a bit of eye candy it kind of gets you right into the action straight off the bat i suppose we've always been given bits here and there about how great a pilot anakin is from pod racing onwards to taking down droid motherships accidentally yes to piloting convertibles around the air streets of Coruscant. So yeah, I think that they're trying to weave in a bit of that because that's part of his legend from the original trilogy. So yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate what they're trying to do. And I agree with you. I think it looks good. I'm watching a, a movie about Star Wars. I want to see lots of space battles and things. So yeah, I liked what they had going on there. And I think that was one of the things that stuck with me about what I liked about this originally. The redeeming features of this movie that I clung to upon watching it the first time round. Yeah, although I'm constantly confused by how much Obi-Wan seems to hate flying, yet how much he has to do it. <laughs> yeah. Because he has most of the cool piloting stuff in the last one as well. Yeah, he just has to... It's to grin and bear it. <laughs> it's just part of the job for him. <laughs> I like that, though, how Obi-Wan's ship was getting torn apart and poor R4 bites the dust. Yeah. We're supposed to maybe feel sorry for that? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, he had a name. Yeah, I can't really say that I did feel sorry, but that was a thing that happened. Yeah, and then Anakin almost shoots him down. It's like, stop doing that. It's like, yeah, I agree. Bad idea. <laughs> After he's just shot at him a few times. Is it the best space battle we've had in Star Wars? I suppose until Rogue One, which granted was only two films later. Three if you include the Clone Wars. Yeah, it's pretty good. Although I feel like once they get onto the ship and they start the Palpatine rescue, it feels as if that ship is... Okay, it does eventually crash, but you can see the battle going on out the window, but until the ship begins to crash, there's no real jeopardy of, oh, there's a massive space battle going on outside. (laughs) Well, there is the bit where they get attacked by the ship that flies alongside it. Maybe it was a tactic to not attack that one when they identified it was Grievous' ship. (laughs) Possibly. Because we've got guys on there. Yeah, right, exactly. We know that they're on there. We know the Chancellor's on there, so stay away. Yeah, but even though they still do attack it and... And it falls apart and they have to crash land it and stuff, which is pretty cool. Although it's funny when Obi-Wan says, we're in the atmosphere, when you you can see through the window that there's just fire everywhere. You can see that. It's all the narration. I guess that's for kids as well to explain what's going on, but it's narrating stuff that you can quite clearly see. Yes, the Rick Ollier effect. Yeah, it's just kind of annoying. (laughs) It's a great level for a video game, whether it be Lego Star Wars or the PS2 Revenge of the Sith game, which I also had. Didn't play that? It had a great beat-em-up two-player mode where you can play as different characters from the films and fight them against each other. You could do old Ben Kenobi versus Grievous if you want. If that's the mashup you ever wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> In Lego Star Wars, you just run around smashing stuff, trying to get as many studs as you can. Yes. And then being annoyed when you don't hit the true Jedi one on your first try. 
got to get those multipliers unlocked. Yeah, that's it. But yeah, that's a cool sequence. It's probably one you could just watch independently of this. You could just watch it as a set piece and just enjoy it for what it is. Up to another happy landing. Yeah, very much. Yeah, it will be one with his dad jokes. <laughs> At least Hugh McGregor's having fun, though. I hope he has some fun in the Obi-Wan show and cracks gags like that, because it's part of who he is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's interesting watching this. It's the first time I've watched it since the show had been announced and there were trailers and there's that anticipation of being back with the character again. So that put a different spin on it and thinking, what's next? What are we about to see? Because I have enjoyed watching Ewan McGregor play the character and he's been one of the better bits about this. We've shouted out Ian McDermott. I think he's been consistently good throughout as well. So I had one eye on the Obi-Wan show while I was watching this thinking what will this do what will this context change about the character well there's something that I hope they bring up in the Obi-Wan show that we'll get to I can't remember if we discussed it when we discussed the trailer in one of the news pods but we'll get to it anyway Obi-Wan versus Grievous that fight was pretty boring not much to it the chase is quite fun I suppose yeah it's fine he takes that lizard dinosaur thing which to begin with is yelping away while he's riding it and then he assumes that it's going to be stealthy when he has to sneak in and observe yeah, this what's thing. that about i don't know he pats it a couple of times and i was thinking okay he's using some sort of jedi trick to calm it down and just say right power down you just stop yelping now bit strange but then yes it goes for a little bit of a race against grievous's unicycle again probably for the sake of selling toys uh, and play sets yeah it's just sort of action fluff isn't it it wasn't all that interesting and then the way that he was dispatched as well it, it's not as if i suppose he's a sort of minor villain because we know palpatine is the big bad but even for a sort of mid-tier villain or this is the culmination of a trilogy this guy should be a bit of a threat he wields four lightsabers and is dispatched pretty easily <laughs> <laughs> it's not as if there was very much jeopardy going on yeah yeah And he remarks upon Obi-Wan being the negotiator, which is not something that is ever backed up by anything in any of the films. At no point do you see him negotiating with anyone. Again, he does it sometimes in Clone Wars, in the actual Clone Wars movie. I don't know if you've seen the movie, the animated movie. Yeah. With the bit where he's waiting for Anakin to do sneak attack. And he pretends to surrender. It's like, we need to discuss the terms of our surrender. He grabs a couple of rocks that sit on with a force and so on. And they sit and have a chat. If I mention that, though, because it has no bearing on anything. Because they haven't decided on that at that point either. Weird. The negotiator. It wasn't even something that was half-heartedly mentioned in the original trilogy, which is why all the Jedi are now generals. Because mm. they said General Kenobi in A New Hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just more confusion. <laughs> yeah, Grievous. Doesn't amount to a hill of beans, as they say. But the big one, Anakin versus Obi-Wan. I remembered this fight being more impressive than it actually is. Same. And the reason I don't like it as much as some people would have you believe I should like it is because it's too showboaty. I feel like that gets in the way of the weight and the passion associated with it because you have Anakin doing all these lightsaber flourishes. You know, he does his twirls, they do their flips and everything. And I feel like it should be more brutal than that they should just be trying to whack each other you know like luke and return of the jedi that's what it should be like yeah i agree i think that luke versus vader one and luke versus vader two are better because of course they don't have the several decades later worth of cgi to be able to rely upon and yeah there's just more weight more visceral i think that that would have worked really well for these characters who i don't believe earned (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the emotional weight that this fight should have had but it would have been good if they'd gone for it like that and if it had been more of a brutal broadsword fight almost rather than this sort of ninja style that they go for and i think that a lot of the staging of it is pretty clumsy as well i agree with your analysis of it that it's kind of showboaty beyond the actual flipping around and wielding lightsabers the way that it progresses i like all the gantry stuff because it makes me think of the jeopardy of cloud city and that kind of thing but again it's kind of comes back to this sort of cgi thing where you have to show it on this scale and there's all this weird swinging on wires and then when they end up on those droids or whatever those floating platforms are and i just think it definitely doesn't feel real okay we're talking about guys wielding laser swords but it doesn't feel like there is weight to it or it doesn't feel like they're actually able to come together and clash in the way that they are and i think if they had just been whacking each other if it had been along one gantry or if it had just been i suppose the ray versus kylo ren on 
whatever planet that was that had the Death Star wreckage, that felt a bit more like what I would have wanted to see here. It's not as if they're exploring all of a Lego Star Wars level. Climbing up, (laughs) climbing down, jumping off, jumping onto something else. If it's more about the character versus the character, two combatants rather than show me the whole level, I don't need to see all of that. Yeah, it was getting in the way of all of it. There is one visceral bit where Anakin just straight up tries to strangle him. (laughs) Yeah, well, they should have just had that. They should have been more gritty and more... This is hand-to-hand combat. It's melee combat. It's not firing lasers at each other from across a landscape. They should be up in each other's faces. Maybe bantering a bit as they go as well. Yeah. Well, they do some of that a bit. It's awful. <laughs> but I think, yes, old-school swashbuckling would have been better. Like Vin Diesel fighting Jason Statham with giant wrenches. <laughs> yes. Until an explosion breaks the arena that they're fighting on and separates them so that neither of them can win or lose. <laughs> <laughs> as is the contractual obligation in the Fast and Furious franchise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Tough guys can't lose fights. That's the way it is. They can only be distracted and have to stop. Whereas that couldn't have ended like this. Forces of nature have to get in the way. Yeah. So, like I said, it was showboy. And one criticism that you can lobby at any of the prequel lightsaber fights, really, as opposed to the original trilogy lightsaber fights, is in the prequels, they aren't fighting to kill. They're fighting to sustain the fight so they are fighting to hit the lightsaber rather than hit the person wielding the lightsaber if that makes sense yeah so there's a lot of that in this fight with anakin it goes on what 20 minutes or something like that it's quite long and it is because they are parrying essentially they don't seem to ever be trying to hit each other there's even the bit where they're swinging on said wires and they just swipe the lightsaber so that they touch when they're passing each other it's like neither of you need to do this <laughs> You have no chance of hitting. You shouldn't be swinging because there's no chance of you hitting your opponent and you're leaving yourself vulnerable. There's also all this chat about lightsaber combat where couldn't you just defeat all your opponents by going to hit their lightsaber, turning yours off, and then turn it back on instantly and so you get past it. Because there isn't a cooldown, is there? (laughs) Depends what level you are. That's kind of what Kylo Ren does in Last Jedi. He catches it and then turns it on. I do think that yes, since the original trilogy where lightsabers felt like an actively dangerous thing to encounter they've been nerfed for want of a better term, whether it's in the prequels where yes it's more about how many flips you can do and how many spins of your saber you can do before you have it parried and then in the sequels they don't feel as lethal I don't think. It just feels as if you could receive a glancing blow and then as long as you've got a back to suit nearby then you're going to be fine. (laughs) Whereas I always felt, maybe because I was a lot younger when I was watching the originals for the first time, it always felt really dangerous. If someone ignited a lightsaber and you heard that, even the sound sounds dangerous so you don't want that anywhere near you. And I think Lucas's original conception of them is that they were heavy. Right. So it's like wielding a broadsword. Yep. You don't make your movements lightly. You see that when Luke, he's always two-handed, isn't he? Yes. When he's using it. Invader's one-handed sometimes, but he's a cyborg. He's really strong. So you can see why that is. But in terms of the, the actual lightsaber combat in this, I was looking, or not at the time I wasn't, I was loving it. I suppose at the time I was like, yeah, this is great. Look at all the flips. Look at this. <laughs> you get to see the lightsabers just be these really cool dynamic weapons. And I suppose you could have different types of lightsabers if you wanted. You could have the more defensive heavy set ones that your Aragorn type Jedi wield. And then you have the smaller dagger-like ones. I don't know. But I think the idea is they're supposed to be heavy because they're a purely defensive weapon and it's about strategically fighting rather than just wildly swinging until you hit something, which is essentially what you get here. But the Rogue One Vader hallway fight, it's not a fight, it's a slaughter, but that as well, the movements are very deliberate and real menace to it. And a lot of people say, oh, that one scene in Rogue One redeems Vader. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's cool, but it doesn't fix this <laughs> by association. Yeah. In retrospect, I would like to see more of that. And I know you haven't seen Rebels, but have you seen the clip of Darth Maul and Obi-Wan's final bout in that? I have not. Oh, it's really cool. What happens is they square up to one another. They size each other up and then Obi-Wan takes them out in like two moves because they're two old guys at this point. So the flips and whatever would have been unrealistic, but Mm -hmm. Rebels fed more into that old school samurai type approach to lightsaber combat. There's an episode where one of the characters is teaching another character how to use a lightsaber and talks about the forms and things, which I know is an expanded universe thing. There's basic lightsaber forms that everybody learns. Mm Mm-hmm. Here's your defensive posture, here's your attack posture, here's whatever. It's it's a game of chess, isn't it? Right. It's supposed to be. I would find that more interesting, and that's maybe because I'm older now, and I agree that when I saw this the first time, I thought... 
that's cool because there's two guys swinging lightsabers at each other and flipping around. Makes a crappy video game, doesn't it? If you're like, well, I have to wait and see if he lifts his elbow ever so slightly, giving me an in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll send you the clip of Obi-Wan fighting Maul after this. It doesn't last long, but it's really quite interesting. But yes, I wonder if it is just to do with your approach as a viewer. I've taken more to video games that require a bit of patience recently. Things like Ghost of Tsushima or Dark Souls or... Fallen Order. Fallen Order, yes, of course. And if I tried those when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have had the patience required for it because this is more of a Lego video game that we're seeing here because it's just about mashing buttons and and smashing stuff. You will learn patience. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're too young to play those video games. (laughs) I can understand the mentality of when the prequels came around. We have the money and we have the technology to make these lightsaber fights far more dynamic than they would. Audiences aren't necessarily going to respond to the samurai type approach, which is weird because that factors into the end of the fight in a way, Mm. because it's about don't try and make that move. I have the advantage and then Anakin gives it a go and he loses. So that is a bit of that. Cut out the rest of the fight and that kind of makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. But then having the high ground has become a bit of a meme as well. Yeah. You can jump 50 feet, but I'm slightly above you. Yeah. And so if they hadn't been flipping around and jumping off platforms and onto platforms and onto droids and swinging off wires, then being slightly further up a slope than somebody else might have seemed like a more significant position. Yeah, it's something that was pointed out to me. I can't credit myself with ever noticing this. In Return of the Jedi, where Luke jumps to the top of a platform and Vader says, Obi-Wan has taught you well. (laughs) 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 Laughing at himself there. Oof, (laughs) self-burn. Literally. Whole body (laughs) (laughs) self-burn. But that is almost a samurai-type strategic end where Obi-Wan's been fighting this whole time to get to that point where he has the tactical advantage and he recognises that. And then... Anakin thinks he's able to get around that and he's not. His arrogance is his undoing in that respect. The thing is, it doesn't even make sense because Maul was in that position in the first film. He had the high ground. (laughs) Yeah. He could have easily swiped at Obi-Wan when he was on his way up. (laughs) Didn't for some reason. The high ground bit's ridiculous. And this is the bit I was talking about that I hope they pick up on the show. Because Obi-Wan's choices here are ridiculous. Obi-Wan makes the wrong choice. He just leaves him there to die. Which probably isn't the Jedi way. To prolong his suffering by assuming that he's just going to expire despite having had his limbs cut off and being engulfed in flame. Yeah, because Obi-Wan walks away before he catches fire, doesn't he? I don't know. It's after, isn't it? Yeah, I think he catches fire and then Obi-Wan has this kind of disgusted look on his face. (laughs) And you'd think, yeah, if that was really your friend, your brother, you'd put him out of his misery. I know he said that he couldn't kill Anakin, it's already been established, but you'd think by the time that you'd maimed him and dismembered him and seen him writhing around in horrible pain that you'd want to do something about it. Or help him. Either put him out of his misery, kill him as a mercy killing to end his suffering, or help him. Take him with you. Try and show him the error of his ways. He's a stub. He's not going to do anything. (laughs) He has one working arm, I suppose. The cry of, I hate you, as well, that was a bit... Mm. Much. So I hope in the Obi-Wan show he picks up on that because they're going to encounter each other in the show. And yes. I would like to see Obi-Wan apologise for just leaving him behind, giving up on him at that point and recognising that was a wrong decision. Because I will believe that he makes that wrong decision because he's never been a good teacher. He's never been all that forward thinking in the way that he approaches situations, has he? No. He messed up Anakin's teaching throughout. He constantly berated him. He just didn't take the right approach at all. He didn't encourage him at all. At this point, I can see why he'd think, well, I'm just going to leave him. It's fine. He's burning to death. It's all good. I could poke him through the brain and his suffering would be over. <laughs> but he won't learn anything if I do that. <laughs> yes, but for the sake of the creation of Darth Vader, he just has to. So no one was going to die in this fight. No. And I do wonder if there was another way of doing it where Obi-Wan can still win, but not definitively at the point where he believes that leaving Anakin behind will kill him. Because he must know as soon as Vader emerges that he's like, oh God, oops. Was, <laughs> well, he does. I mean, he knows the secret, doesn't he? Yeah. He keeps it from Luke actively, so he's mm-hmm. just a coward and a liar is Obi-Wan, really. How are you going to get around that in the TV show? He's a compulsive liar, and then he brushes it off as, oh, well, lies are a point of view, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> from a certain point of view. You've been listening to Palpatine there, just colouring the truth the way you do it. Because again, Yoda and Obi-Wan are pretty awful, really, to look in that respect. They lie to him. They put him in a position where he's probably going to get killed. 
Yeah, they're just bitter old men at that point. Yeah, if this fails, whatever. We'll get Leia. She'll be all right. <laughs> She'll defeat him, maybe. Or there's a few other Jedi out there. We'll go find the guy from the Fallen Order. He'll do it. Other Jedi are kicking about at the same time. <laughs> Some non-canon ones. Star Killer, he's out there somewhere. He's much more powerful, actually. Let him do it. There was a better way to do that that still has Obi-Wan dismember him, but maybe separate them after that point and make it clear that Obi-Wan knows that he survived. Hmm. I don't know how you do that. It would be part of that whole samurai fight that we were talking about, I suppose. That's where you have your force of nature. They're standing on a rock in this lava flow and it splits and they are separated and go their separate ways. Yeah, because we can't jump 50 feet to get over this gap. No. That would be suicide. I don't know, you could do something with it. But then Darth Vader has birthed the first chronological line that James Earl Jones delivers is, where is Padme? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, I suppose there's some kind of thematic, there's some interesting things going on where he's being reconstructed or he's being created or possibly born as Darth Vader, even though he's already been dubbed that earlier on. And this is juxtaposed with the birth of his children. So you've got Padme going through childbirth, Anakin going through whatever horrific procedure you would call that. (laughs) Just getting locked inside a leather and metal suit. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> horrible Hayden Christensen on stilts playing the role of Darth Vader in this movie as well on stilts well lifts in his shoes or whatever he was in the okay. costume but obviously David Prowse was hired because he's a tall man mm. Hayden Christensen not as tall and I believe he's going to be doing the same thing in the Obi-Wan show as well he's going to be in the suit because that makes a difference you really need to know that for some reason <laughs> but he asked where Padme is Palpatine's like oh yeah you killed her she's gone it was your fault so you wonder why there's no reckoning when he finds out that Luke Skywalker's kicking about. Like, you told me that I killed him. <laughs> I suppose by that point he's already planning to overthrow the Emperor, so he has to just seem like he doesn't care. Yeah. It's hard to equate Anakin Skywalker in this film with the ruthless Darth Vader that you see in the original trilogy. They don't feel like the same guy. No, it's a tough one. As you say, with the Padme line and the much maligned no. <laughs> That they put into Return of the Jedi as well. No. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, dear. (laughs) There's not much more you need to say about it, really. That line has taken such a kicking. (laughs) The funniest bit is when someone's put an S sound at the front, so you say snow instead. It's really funny. (laughs) Really good. It's my favourite thing about that. Yeah, it's just dumb. And you see the Death Star being built and young Tarkin, but not the same young Tarkin from Rogue One. Mm. I don't know if that's... CGI or they just found some guy that looks a bit like him I can't remember possibly before they'd started dabbling with deep fake technology yeah it's okay for Palpatine because he's just mangled anyway you don't know how old he is doesn't matter that he's younger in the 70s or the 80s when those films were made so that's all right I think seeing Vader in the suit despite the lamentable aspects to it that we've just described that was another one of these things where you could convince yourself that this was the best of the prequels because finally, finally, <laughs> finally we got to see some Darth Vader. It doesn't do very much, but at least he's in the suit. You hear him breathing. You've got that iconic imagery. And even though it's basically trashing one of cinema's great villains to see three movies of how he ended up that way, as a fan, <laughs> I might not sound like a fan after all these <laughs> pods we've done trashing them. It's still good to see that. It's still fun to see the two of them together, despite the fact that it's at the end of... <laughs> this is it his new hope costume though because the costume changes between a new hope and empire strikes back i'm pretty sure it's not the the red lenses and stuff when they first go on when you see it from his pov you see the red yeah yeah but i don't know because he looks shinier than he does at the beginning of star wars so you'd think that they would have matched that up but then there's all sorts of things like leia being able to remember her mother's face and that sort of (laughs) thing that just doesn't make any sense yeah the impression you get from Return of the Jedi is that Leia was raised by Padme for a bit and then she dies young for some reason. Yeah, and I think that from The Phantom Menace where you know that Anakin's love interest is a queen, you think, okay I can see where this is going. This is possibly how Princess Leia could have come about. Yeah, even though he's 9 and she's 14, 15. Yeah. That's a bit weird. (laughs) Yeah, but still, I had to assume that that was what was going on. You think, right, this is where you get this idea of a bit of royal lineage. But no, it doesn't come from that at all. A democratically elected teenage queen. Yeah. Yeah, none of that adds up. Would you trust a 15, 14-year-old in charge of a country? Based on the country we have, couldn't do much worse. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, why not? Give it a go. We've tried everything else. 
Well, we haven't. We've barely tried anything. But it'd be a change. Change is better than what we've got now, potentially. Yeah, so there was that, and that whole birth sequence is just really annoying. It's She's dying. She's fine, but she's dying for some reason. She's, she's lost the, the will, will to live. live. <laughs> and Much so like many people audience. watch can identify with her. <laughs> All right, she's had her heart broken because Anakin's turned evil and maybe he's dead. Obi-Wan came gloating about, oh, yeah, I just killed him. Here's his lightsaber. I'll keep it. And I'll give it to his son in the future or whatever, and then uh, I'll hold it over his head and it's going to be all messy. <laughs> but Padme's at this point where she has her heart broken. She believes that Anakin's evil slash dead. And she's just to say, you know, I'm just going to die and leave my two kids alone in this horrible world that I had a heart in creating. I'm out. <laughs> I've done it. It's the equivalent of a politician resigning after they've broken the country, isn't it? I suppose. Mm-hmm. Except she just dies <laughs> and then gets a state funeral. Yes, which Jar Jar shows up to. Yeah, of course. He has to be there. <laughs> That's all a bit confusing. And she names them immediately, which is quite funny. Luke, Leia, here you go. Yeah, I suppose for some reason it was important that they got those names from their mother, or possibly it was just because the babies appear in this and we need to have it confirmed that that's who they are. <laughs> yeah. Hey everyone, Luke, Leia, you know them, don't you? You've seen them in other films. <laughs> and you think they would have discussed if they had a daughter be named after Anakin's mother because of what happened to her as a mark of respect or whatever? Yes, Princess Shmi. Yeah, or then Jimmy Smith says, nah, Shmi's a dumb name, Leia. <laughs> <laughs> if we call her Shmi, Vader's going to rumble it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like if we keep the name Skywalker for Luke, but don't worry. He'll never look on Tatooine, even though, as you know from side content, Tatooine is a bustling port of activity that everybody goes through at some point. (laughs) Everyone's there. Nah, he'll never know. Yeah, he'll never find out. He won't use any of his incredible Chosen One powers. Yeah. One thing we skipped over is the Order 66 sequence, actually. I think that's pretty excellent. Again, it's well scored, which really helps you invest in all those people you don't know getting murdered. (laughs) Yep. Unless you've read comics and side content and stuff. Most of them are quite prominent in the Clone Wars. The bit where Plo Kloon, for example, gets shot out of the sky. I'm like, I know that guy. It's a shame. I agree that the music does a lot of the heavy lifting, but it's about as emotional as it can be for, as you say, a load of characters who aren't that familiar with. But you're supposed to know that the destruction of the Jedi is a pretty bad thing. So (laughs) seeing them all go down like that is emotive. Although I find the concept of Order 66 a bit of a cheat because it's this catch-all, kill-all Jedi button, as opposed to, again, in the original trilogy, when you hear about the hunt, he's and killed all the Jedi Knights. You would expect it to be a more protracted, long-form campaign. You just program a clause into the clone's brain where all you have to do is say those three words and then boom. And they can't all have been surrounded by clones at the time, though, so... Well, they weren't. Maybe it's implied that there was a bit more of a hunt. A handful of them survived, yeah. Yeah. But I did think it was strange how Palpatine, it wasn't as if he sent out one message because it looks like he gives one message to Cody. Because he says Commander Cody, yeah. <laughs> and then he gives a different message. To, so was he making these calls personally? Next in the address book, okay, Order 66, please. Next, they'll just hang up, speed dial. Maybe it's like an email blast that automatically fills in the names. It's like, hi, name. <laughs> <laughs> Order 66 has dynamic content. <laughs> Hi, name. <laughs> Kill all Jedi. Congratulations. You've been chosen to execute Order 66. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that made me wonder about, especially when Cody receives the call, as far as you know, he's the only one that sees it. Yeah. Then he just turns around and he's like, kill him. And then it fires immediately. <laughs> Did the other clones see it when they're in proximity? One that gets activated? Do they get activated? Or is there a voice that comes in their helmet? <laughs> and does it just override they're that loyal that despite the fact that they've been fighting alongside these Jedi, they're just like, all right, yeah, cool, blast them. Again, that's something that the Clone Wars show fleshes out. There's an episode where a clone malfunctions and accidentally kills a Jedi, and it's because of that deep built-in thing. And then they all talk about there's this thing within them that they know about, but they don't know what it is. It's this weird feeling that they have, I suppose. I I think that's how they describe it. And then in the finale of Clone Wars, there's a character in it called Rex. They keep rumouring is going to come back in one of these shows. Tamura Morrison's already there. Why not? He just needs a big beard. But Rex is one of the main clones that you see in Clone Wars. So he's a good friend of Ahsoka and Anakin and so on. And Ahsoka's on one of the Jedi cruisers in the last episode, and all of the clones turn against her. And she extracts this gland or whatever it is from Rex. 
so that he's not affected by it anymore. It's a chip or something. It's a device that was snuck in during the cloning process. A MacGuffin. That the Jedi somehow also missed. Hmm. And they do it quite well in that episode where the clone malfunctions. The Kaminoans try and paint it as he's gone insane. And that's all it is. And then the clone ends up dying before they get to the bottom of it. But they're pretty close. Yeah, it's just a shame that none of that is explained. (laughs) No, it's just initiate Order 66. No problem. (laughs) But I think there's some non-canon now stuff of clones coming to their senses afterwards. And being like, oh no. I don't know if the Bad Batch would cover that in some way. Probably. I've not watched it. Possibly, and that might also cover the interim between the ex-Republic, now Galactic Empire, using a clone army and then having to rely on child recruits, stealing children to make them into FN-217 or whatever. I think that was more of a First Order thing. It's not the Empire, they're just conscripts. Yeah, but was it, I don't know, I'm sure I've heard some sort of theories or possibly this is based on stuff that i haven't seen that is actually canon but it's about the clone life cycle and how they ended up having to start getting non-clone troopers so that when you get to stormtroopers they're no longer clones they're people and that explains the height differences and voice differences and behavior differences yeah and again rebels rex shows up and he's pretty old it's a few years before a new hope so it's like 20 odd years after this so it seems like they just age normally once they hit Django Fett's age, as in fighting age, 20s or whatever. They just age normally after that. I see, okay. But Bad Batch covers that post-Order 66 period, so it probably gets mentioned. Maybe there's some guilt or whatever, I don't know. I need to watch it. I meant to, I just haven't. There's no point in me sitting speculating about it. (laughs) When the answers are out there for you. Yeah, I could just be watching it right now instead of doing (laughs) this. But no, it's a good sequence. It works really well. And yeah, there's some recognisable faces in there. Again, Plo Kloon. I don't know any of the other names. Shout out Ki Adi Mundi. Oh yes, you've got the, the squid hair guy, he is part of Mace Windu's detachment that gets unceremoniously murdered by the Emperor. His name escapes me now, but yeah, Kit Fisto, is that him? That's the one. There's one who dies in a deleted scene at the start of the film. She's there in the throne room, hmm. but since that's not canon, she ends up being one of the people you fight in The Force Unleashed. All oh, right. Can't remember her name. One listener is now shouting at the screen, It's this girl! It's her name! It's... <laughs> Yeah, pretty bleak ending, isn't it? The Jedi are wiped out. Younglings have been killed. As hilarious as that is. Yoda decides, I'm out. I'm off into exile. There's a swamp planet I can go to. I'll just hide out there for a bit. I've got a timeshare on Dagobah that I can get to. Yeah. There's snakes. I can make soup. I'll be all right. Yeah. There's a weird cave. There's a dark side cave. Evil tree. There's that. So I'll go there. Obi-Wan, I'll go be a creepy hermit on Tatooine watching over Luke until in about 10 years I'll have an adventure that takes me away from Tatooine for a bit. That'll be fun. Jimmy Smits, I'm going to raise this kid until my planet's blown up, probably with me on it. Yeah, it is a pretty bleak end for most of them. (laughs) I don't know, is he on it? It's not confirmed, is it? He's on the ship in Rogue One. Maybe he stays there. Mm. Yeah, bleak ending. Looks hopeless, but then you've got hope because we all know what that kid grows up to be. I was trying to think of a way of dropping in some blue milk drinking or milking whatever those <laughs> sea cows are on Acto. I think the ending feels a bit neat though because they are just quickly ticking off the here's where this person needs to be, here's where this person needs to be. Why doesn't C-3PO tell the full story? Wipe his memory. Job yes. done. Yeah, it's strange. For a fairly long movie for the end just to be like dusting off their hands like, oh, we did it. We stuck the landing. Everyone is where they need to be. Everyone's in position now. Great job, guys. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to sow the seeds of the rebellion. We don't want to give you more Vader. We don't want to do any of this. We don't want to give you anything more than what you already know, which is the same sin that Solo commits, isn't it? Here's everything that you already know. Yes. Plus, we'll maybe do spin-offs. Who knows? Watch The Bad Batch, because that will tell you exactly what happened after all this. (laughs) (laughs) The show that we haven't even conceived of that won't exist until Disney buys the property, which is quite a while off at this point. So on that note, do you have anything else you want to say about Revenge of the Sith before we say goodbye? No, as usual, I feel slightly guilty at having given this film a kicking because I, at one point, was trying to enjoy it. (laughs) Convincing myself that I enjoyed it the same way that I did with the first two prequel films. Did you do it in one sitting this time? Because last year you said it was four settings for clones i did i stuck it out i think with the context of the obi-wan show coming up that was 
one slightly more interesting reason for watching this or thing to think about contemplate while I was watching it I don't know when I might watch it again which is a bit of a shame I watched it on DVD because I own the DVD not Disney Plus where it's in 4k not Disney Plus no I thought I'm just gonna crack out the DVD I own it (laughs) I may as well watch it on that format because I'm gonna have this piece of physical media forever so why not I liked the bits that we've just described about liking i thought the bits that we thought were laughable were laughable it's a shame there's so much potential we wanted so much for the prequels to be amazing and try as we might at the time and every other time since yeah they just didn't quite pan out definitely not i watched it on disney plus in 4k i don't know if there's been any fudging with it in the meantime i think the prequels are largely untouched the only difference is cgi yoda and phantom menace i think for the blu-ray yeah that's about the only one I can think of. Yeah, I just watched it on Disney Plus, but I don't own it in any other format, actually. I don't have the DVD, I never bought it. I do have, or I used to have, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones on DVD, but I don't have them anymore. I just got rid of them when I ordered 66 to most of my DVDs. <laughs> Am I ever going to watch this again? Nope. The Disney Plus version is the 4K version. Makes the CGI look even worse. <laughs> <laughs> I did it in one sitting as well, but that was mostly down to time. I left it to the last minute to watch it, Hmm. whereas otherwise I might have turned it off. I think I did turn it off to make lunch, actually. I paused it at a point and went to make lunch, which nobody needs to hear about. No one's interested in how I watch this film. No, no. Everyone loves hearing about the process. It's interesting in a way because the last two films I didn't watch in a single sitting. The Phantom Menace I was watching in, say, 20-minute chunks, I think it was, Hmm. Attack of the Clones, I think, like yourself, it was three or four individual views. Mm -hmm. It's not interesting, but I've watched it and I'll probably never watch it again. It's interesting that you went back to SD, which stands for, I'm not going to say it because it's swear, but crappy definition. (laughs) Sith def. Sith definition, there we go. (laughs) So that must have been a throwback, seeing it on the old format. Yeah, well, I've, as I say, I'm not going to get rid of this box set. (laughs) So I thought I may as well just make use of it. (laughs) Funniest thing is, I don't own any Star Wars before the new films on physical format because I refused to buy the original trilogy until they release a high definition version of the theatrical versions. Right. Well, I have the theatricals on Sith Def as well. Yeah, but those are even worse because they're laser disc scans or something like that. They're not very yeah. good. <laughs> you need to get your hands on the despecialized editions. That's where it's at. Well, they are what they are and they're the only versions that I watch. So. The Despecialized Editions, if you don't know, are a project that a bunch of fans did where they're taking from dozens of different sources to try and recreate the theatrical editions in high definition. I believe they've managed to do it in 4K now, which I haven't gotten a hold of. I've got them in, I think it's 720p was the last time I looked for it, but I could go and look for it. I'll put it in the show notes, the video that shows the work that they've done, because it's really remarkable stuff, and it shows how much damage was done to them in order to crowbar it back. Because I think... Luke has changed the original negative, so it's actually impossible to just screen a version of the theatrical version anymore because they don't exist. There's no reels that exist. He orders 66 every single one of them, wow. probably. What a guy. I have no objection to him changing these films. There are his films. He can do whatever he wants. My objection is making the originals unavailable. Let me stick in a Blu-ray and make a choice as to what version I want to watch. I think that's fair. Yeah, so you're saying that he dealt in absolutes when it came to which version you could watch? He did. He absolutely did. But yes, I won't watch this probably ever again. I found it interesting the way I was reading Anakin as a character with my knowledge of the Clone Wars, because I haven't watched this film since I've been watching the Clone Wars. Mm. And I realised I did the same pause that Peter did there. (laughs) And he says since, except I finished the sentence, I'm like him. And other knowledge is fed into it as well, such as we've got the Obi-Wan show coming up, a bit of Vader and Rogue One. We've had a little bit of texture added since then. Vader's appearance in Rebels as well. It doesn't do anything to this film, but it gives you a bit of supplementary. The return of Palpatine as well. Since the last time I watched this, oh yeah, God, that would not have been a thing. Yeah, you thought that, oh, don't worry, he'll get his comeuppance. <laughs> Someday a forced dyad will rise. To <laughs> but how do we know there's not going to be another trilogy where he's behind it all? There will be. It would be rude not to at this point. So just, like, we'll do another one. Yeah, we'll bring Palpatine back, because <laughs> he's kind of got to at this point. Not until film 12, though. We'll lull we'll you into that false sense of security. <laughs> we'll do 10 and 11 with different guys, and then 12, boom, there he is. Yeah. Bind us all along. You thought that was my master plan? This was my master plan. This is it all along. Now I've got TIE Fighters with the planet-destroying weapons. Classic Sheev. Is that actually his name? I keep asking this. 
I believe that canonically that is his first name. Oh my name. god. Sheev Palpatine. <laughs> so close to Steve as well. Steve Palpatine. That's his brother. <laughs> it's like Chad Vader, who's a night shift manager at a supermarket, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Chad Vader, so good. So funny. But yeah, so any wrap-up thoughts then? Anything else to say? I got all my notes done, actually, so that's good. Goodbye, Chewbacca. Miss you, I will. <laughs> oh yeah, he's in this film. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I've said everything I need to say. And yes, that's us completed our Skywalker saga Skywalker saga incredible but in the crawl that I didn't get the chance to raise there are heroes on both sides evil is everywhere great line it tells you everything you need to know yeah heroes on both sides has a bit of a Trumpian ring to it <laughs> oh well evil is everywhere and the first of course word war Star Wars war <laughs> great stuff absolutely great stuff I don't even remember what the rest of the crawl says just there's been Clone Wars let's go for it <laughs> There's been Clone Wars, Anakin's a Jedi Knight, Palpatine's been kidnapped. Somehow he was kidnapped. It seems appropriate somehow to finish with our analysis of the crawl. <laughs> <laughs> the dead speak. Analyze all the crawls. Let's Ugh. not do that. But yeah, I'm glad it's over. That's all I'll say. I'm glad <laughs> the Skywalker saga is over. In all nine Star Wars films that we've seen, there are four good ones, as far as I'm concerned. Four and a half. I'll give Force Awakens half a point. <laughs> Feeling generous. Four and a half. Out of nine, that's half the films, I suppose, are good. Not a bad hit rate, I guess. Better than an Imperial Stormtrooper. Yeah. Reminds me of that joke about a Stormtrooper fighting a red shirt from Star Trek. One can't hit anything and one can't stay alive. Who wins? It's that unstoppable force, immovable object type debate. (laughs) Next year, we're out of Skywalker Star Wars films, main series Star Wars films. We've done all the other ones. We did them as they were coming out. We... Haven't really done The Mandalorian and stuff, although Chris and Aaron did season two. But last year, you suggested that we tackle the Ewok stuff. Yeah, well, I noticed it was on Disney Plus and I feel like I've seen one of them possibly. I've seen none of them. So it might be fun revisiting those as bad as they may be or bad as they probably are. Here's the question. Do we do one a year or do we do both next year? I feel like doing that for two years, the novelty will supremely wear off. (laughs) Yeah, maybe we should do both. I have no idea how long they are. I can see that Caravan of Courage was 1984. Battle for Endor was 1985. Television movies. It's probably not as bad (laughs) to try and do. Luke Skywalker's in one of them, isn't he? Am I making that up? Possibly. Don't know. Warwick Davis is. Well, of course he is. One of them's 97 minutes long. This is the point of the podcast where people look things up on Google. (laughs) One's 97 minutes long and one's 94 minutes long. 94. (laughs) So possibly not too taxing to cover there's not gonna be a lot of analysis in there i'm guessing (laughs) probably not gonna be a whole lot to break down so yeah we could do an ewok special we'll do that next year and the year after it'll be here's an arc of clone wars or something we'll (laughs) figure something out over the next thousand years you'll be slowly digested by consuming the clone wars in chunks god which would i rather watch the clone wars or be consumed by a sarlacc i'll pick the good ones at first i won't pick the jar jar episodes to begin with i won't go straight in with that i'll (laughs) I'll pick some mythology heavy stuff such as maybe one where qui-gon speaks to obi-wan which renders his surprise that he can go commune with qui-gon a bit weird undo everything i ever held to be true (laughs) that's it search your feelings you know it to be canonically squishy (laughs) okay so join us next year for battle for endor and Caravan of Courage. That should be interesting. Can't wait. I'll maybe watch them every day until then (laughs) to build up an immunity. (laughs) So that was our discussion of Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. We would be honoured if you'd press the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any major podcasting app. Wherever you're listening to podcasts, you will find it. It is everywhere. It's all around us like the Force. And we would love it if you'd leave us a comment and a rating, but what rating do you sense? A number associated with The Empire Strikes Back. Episode 5. 5. 5 star. Sounds good to me. If you want to discuss Revenge of the Sith, Star Wars in general, perhaps correct us on some of the mistakes we made throughout this, then please do hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under New Before Blog, or just leave a comment under newbeforeblog.co.uk. And until next time, we would be honoured if you would join us on New Before Pod. So long and thanks for all the sit. Thank you.